Hello, AP Bio. In this video, I'm going to introduce Unit 5. Unit 5 is our study of heredity, and it is the first of our two units where we study genetics. And genetics is the study of heredity. And variation of inherited characteristics. Now, it's probably a good idea for us to define heredity first. Heredity is just the transmission of traits from parents to offspring. So the first thing I'm actually going to do um, is I'm going to uh, define a bunch of terminology um, and we're going to use that terminology to be to talk about heredity and to talk about the study of genetics because there's a lot of specific terms um, that we need to be able to use and you've probably heard of many of them but we are going to use them um, in a precise way when we talk about genetics so I just want to make sure we're all starting off on the same page so first of all let's study let's uh, define genetic material genetic material as you know is DNA specifically DNA is actually the template for proteins. So a template is like a stencil, something that you use to make something else. And that's what DNA actually does. It's, it is, a, is the stencil for proteins. And parents, we talked over here from parents to offspring, parents actually pass DNA, or I should say parent cells. We call them parent cells. We'll talk about it at a cellular level parent cells pass an exact copy of DNA. We call that DNA replication. And we just talked about when that happened to dot what we call daughter cells. So when we have one cell becoming two cells, those are called daughter cells. And we, we talked about that a bit um, in our study of the cell cycle. The term genome refers to the complete set of an organism's DNA. Now, when we the DNA is composed of genes, we'll define that in just a second. Here's how genes are related to the genome. Plus, not all of the DNA codes for proteins. And when it's not a coding protein, we call it non-coding DNA. That doesn't mean it's not important. And we'll talk a lot about that in our next unit. It just means that it's not coding for proteins. Okay, now we've got some C words um, to define. We call from last unit that chromatin is working DNA. So this is the DNA that is relaxed. It may not be actively being transcribed into pro into RNA at that very moment, but it's accessible, or so it's at least potentially accessible. And it's wrapped around these specific proteins called histone proteins, and um, it's present during interphase. So we've got this relaxed DNA. On the other hand, chromosomes are condensed chromatin. And they're um, going to be present during actively active cell division, mitosis. And we'll learn during this unit about meiosis. The term gene specifically refers to a section of the DNA. So one section, if we can think of the DNA as a sentence, the gene is a word, and it's a specifically, it's a template for a protein and actually can be the template for multiple proteins. And we'll talk about how that works too. Now let's talk about how DNA is organized so that it can be passed to offspring. Well, we just got through talking about that with the cell cycle. Remember that the parent cell 
replicates the DNA. It happens during the S phase and organize it before cell division. So it can get this exact copy to daughter cells. It happens in two stages. Remember that the DNA is replicated during the S phase. We call that DNA replication. And then the DNA is divided during mitosis. Remember that's just nuclear division um, or division of the nucleus. Now let's just do a little bit of review of when cells divide. In this unit, we're gonna be talking about sexual reproduction, but I wanna talk first about asexual reproduction, which means that you're, you have offspring that are the result of a single parent as opposed to offspring as a result of two parents. So let's just review that because we've already, uh, we just got through talking about it with the cell cycle. In prokaryotes, Asexual, looks, uh, asexual reproduction looks different than it does in eukaryotes. Let's talk about prokaryotes first. Remember that prokaryotes carry out binary fission. So in the context of sexual reproduction, binary fission is asexual reproduction. One cell, one parent cell becomes two daughter cells in four steps. In the first step, cell grows. In the second step, the DNA replicates. Now when the DNA replicates, it has to be pulled apart. As the cell elongates. So here you can see that here because the DNA is attached to that cell membrane keeping in mind that there's no mitotic spindle, at least in, in most prokaryotes. Then the cytoplasm is going to divide, so that's where we get the cell pinches in. And you can see that here in step three, we get a pinching in of the cell membrane and the, the cell wall of prokaryotes. It's more flexible than the cell wall of plants. And then four, the cell divides. And then we have two daughter cells. Asexual reproduction, one parent, becoming two daughter cells. One parent cell becoming two, two daughter cells. In eukaryotes, we don't really have a fancy name for it. We call it cell division, boring. Where we have one parent cell becoming two daughter cells. And there are some um, organisms that reproduce by asexual reproduction. We'll talk about that in just a sec. But remember, it involves the cell cycle. And in the cell cycle, we have three stages. The longest interface. Then active cell, cell division, which is really division of the nucleus, which is mitosis. That's followed by um, division of the cytoplasm. We can see it over here. We start here in interphase. One cell goes through the three stages of interphase, that's stage one. And then we have stage two, which is the M stage uh, is typically uh, refers to both um, mitosis and cytokinesis. Now over, if we think about the purpose of why prokaryotes asexually reproduce, remember they're all unicellular and eukaryotes can be unicellular or multicellular, but over here, let's just talk about multicellular ones, keeping in mind that they can also be multicellular, uh, unicellular. Actually, let's write that down. They can be unicellular or multicellular. But we're going to talk only about the multicellular down here. Um, Again, over here for the unicellular organisms, it is the purpose of binary fission is for asexual reproduction. So they're going to make offspring with um, the process of binary fission. Same thing over here with unicellular um, organisms and multicellular organisms. Uh, they uh, are going to carry out asexual 
reproduction. This over here in the, in the um, prokaryotes, this results in two daughter cells. I'm going to see them right here. One, two, up in the diagram, one, two. Um, and they, those daughter cells are going to be genetically identical to the parent cell and to each other. Over here in um, eukaryotes, remember that asexual reproduction has other, um, I mean, uh, the cell cycle has other purposes. Some organisms can actually carry out asexual reproduction where one cell can actually become a multicellular organism. Plants can carry out asexual reproduction and species, some species of fungi or most species of fungi can carry out asexual reproduction. Now they also can carry out sexual reproduction and that's the, are the next thing we're gonna talk about, but keep in mind that they can do both. Um, but also the purpose of, um, of the cell cycle is thinking about it in a multicellular organism is just for growth so that organisms can get, can get bigger. And for development, remember, development is distinct from growth and that it's how a single-celled organism develops into a multicellular organism with specialized cells. And then also remember that cells have a lifespan. So we call that renewal when you need new cells, when cells have, uh, so, so you can continually have new cells in areas where cells need to be regenerated. And then also if you have damage repair. So those are all the, the purpose of why cells would need to divide. Now there's two types of um, uh, cell division in eukaryotes only. So in, in prokaryotes, they just do bare binary fission. But in eukaryotes only, we have mitotic cell division. And we just got finished with that, talking about that. And we also have a special kind of division called meiosis also in eukaryotic cells. Both of these refer to division of the nucleus. And because they have a different process, a different purpose, they have a slightly different process. So let's go ahead and let's talk about that. Now we're gonna talk about chapter 13, which you've already read, is about sexual reproduction. Now sexual reproduction involves the process of meiosis, which is just a special type of cell division. And specifically, it's a special type of division of the nucleus that produces what we call gametes. Um, and the reason that meiosis is important or the reason that meiosis must occur is because when there's in sexual reproduction, there's a recombination of um, genetic material, or not a recombination, a combination of genetic material from two different sources. And because of that, the, in order to combine the genetic material of two different sources, you have to cut it in half first so it doesn't double. Every time you combined it, it would double if you weren't able to cut it in half. And that's what gametes are. Gametes are cells that have half the number of chromosomes. So let's write a couple of those things down. In, in order to have sexual reproductions, chromosome, the chromosome number must be reduced for sexual reproduction. <clears throat> sexual reproduction is important because it increases genetic diversity. Now we always talk about that, why it's, that it's important that to increase genetic diversity, but let's think about why. The reason genetic diversity is important is that when in, in a stable environment, if you're just humming happily along, then it doesn't matter if there is a variation in a population. But if we have genetic diversity and in an environment where there's some type of something that gives a particular organism an advantage because they have a variation in some type of character where it's they're okay in that environment or they can take advantage of that environment, then they're gonna survive. However, if, if 
every organism has the exact same uh, ma- a genetic makeup, then if there's something that affects that genetic makeup, the entire species will die. So genetic diversity allows for when environmental changes shift, some organisms will live and some organisms will die. So let's write that down. Diversity. And it doesn't improve the chances of a single organism surviving. It improves the chances of a whole species surviving. Improves the chance of survival when the environment changes. Because no environment is completely stable. Some environments are more stable than others, but no environments are completely stable. Okay, let's let's look and see what meiosis looks like. We're gonna talk, we're gonna model meiosis in class and we're gonna talk about it, but let's, let's look and see uh, what happens just in a really simple diagram over here. And I'm gonna talk about meiosis in terms of mitosis, uh, comparing it, because you already learned the process of cell division, the process of mitosis. So it is helpful, I think, to, to compare it to something that you already know about. So the first thing that's different about meiosis is that it happens only in specific cells, and those cells are called germ cells or germline cells. And those germline cells in animals are located in the sex organs. So your germline cells are in your testes, if you're a biological male, or in your ovaries, if you're a biological female, and they're not anywhere else in your body. Now let's just give this organism two chromosomes. So this is a germline cell in an organism that has two chromosomes. Now in the process of meiosis, the first thing that happens is a cell is gonna go through interphase, and it's gonna replicate its chromosomes in, during the S phase, in this germline cell. So that's the same as it would look like in, uh, in a, a cell that's not a, a germline cell. We call that a somatic cell. So in mitosis, we have the division of somatic cells, but in meiosis, we're, we're dividing germline cells. Anyway, here we have interphase, and this is the S phase. And then the first thing, the thing that happens in meiosis that's different is there's two cell divisions. In the first cell division, I mean, the chromosome number is actually halved. It's called a reductional division. And what happens is, is that during the process of PPMAT, we call this meiosis one. And just like in um, mitosis, we have PPMAT. But something different happens during prophase of, of meiosis, the first division of meiosis, and we get the, the pulling apart of the homologous pairs. The homologous pairs would be pulled apart. So it doesn't do anything to pull apart the sister chromatids. The purpose of meiosis one is to reduce the chromosome number in half. It's a reductional division. Now the cells need to divide again. And when they divide again, we call it meiosis two. And in meiosis two, we have PPMAT again. But the PPMAT this time is gonna tear apart the sister chromatids, just like we saw before in mitosis. So now we have the end, we have four cells, that both by PPMAT. Now because we use the term PPMAT for both, we use a Roman numeral to talk about the different stages of nuclear division in meiosis. So during meiosis one, we have prophase one, prometaphase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one. In meiosis two, during the second division of meiosis, we have prophase two, prometaphase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two, and cytokinesis. We should put that in there too. Um, anyway, so Keeping in mind, we're gonna talk about it more and we're gonna do a lab so it becomes clear. Keeping in mind that the differences between, the big differences, broad strokes differences between meiosis and mitosis is it starts with a specific type of cell in a specific place and then there's two cell divisions. We have meiosis one where the chromosome number is divided in half and then meiosis two where the sister chromatids are taken apart. This kind of is similar to mitosis.
or a mitotic division because we've just got separation of the sister chromatids. Okay, now let's fit um, the process of meiosis into the human sexual life cycle. So I'm gonna add a little bit more terminology, but let's talk about where meiosis fits in. If meiosis is over here, we're gonna balance it out if, and it's a halving process. We halved the number of chromosomes. Remember that in sexual reproduction, the whole purpose of having the number of chromosomes is because they need to be combined. And the combining of two uh, organisms DNA, we call that process fertilization or in the context of cell, sexual reproduction, we call it fertilization. We have other words for it too in other places. Now, um, if we look at what happens during meiosis, it produces the sex cells. And in humans, the gametes. In humans, in a biological male, the gamete is called sperm. And in the biological females, it's called ova. Now that, that sperm and that ova come together in the process of fertilization that produces a zygote. So that's that single celled uh, that results from the fusion of the sperm and the egg. Now in a multicellular organism, what happens in order to make a multicellular organism, there's a whole bunch of cell division that happens and or uh, the zygote goes through a whole bunch of cell division, mitotic division, to produce a multicellular adult organism. Now that that my taught that multicellular adult organism in its sex organs in its germline cells can carry out meiosis. So that is how that's the human sexual life cycle and we the meiosis fits in meiosis isn't sexual reproduction but when combined with the doubling process of fertilization that's the sexual life cycle. But in humans, because we're multicellular, it also includes asexual cell reproduction, which is what we call mitosis. Okay, now we have to define a bunch of words in order to add some more detail to our um, diagram here. I'm gonna define these words down here. The first word I wanted to find is the term ploidy. And ploidy, we refer, refer to it as N, is the number of sets of chromosomes, entire sets. So your sets of chromosomes are coming from a parent. We are most animals and humans are what we call diploid. So that's our ploidy number. Our ploidy number is 2n, which means an organism or a cell, you could say, that has two complete sets. of every chromosome. And you know, you get one from your mom and one from your dad. Because you have two complete sets of chromosomes, if you think about our conversation from just earlier in this flip, that that means that if, if the chromosomes are DNA and the genes are sections of DNA, that means you have two of every gene. And we'll, we're gonna talk all about that. That's what the rest of this unit is about. The term haploid, refers to organisms that only have a single set of chromosomes. So we just use N for that. So that's an organism. Some multicellular organisms or single celled organisms are haploid or a cell that has on only one complete set of chromosomes or of each chromosome. So some multicellular organisms, like some species of, or many species of fungi, are haploid in their multicellular state. Humans are only haploid. The only cells that are haploid in humans are our sex cells. Now there's also polyploidy. And poly polyploid organisms are just greater than 2N. So they're 3N, 4N, 5N, and that's just an organism or a cell that has just more than two, greater than two, complete sets of chromosomes. 
So for example, um, wheat, cultivated wheat is hexaploid. Ooh, I've written, I've written out of space. Hexaploid, which means it has um, six copies of uh, every chromosome. So it has six copies of every gene. Okay, now what I wanna do is that let's take these words up here and let's add them to our diagram up here. So in the human sexual life cycle, the process of, let's, let's look at humans first. Humans are diploid. So let's write that down here. We're diploid, 2N. And a human multicellular organism is gonna be 2N. But if we draw a dotted line right here in the sexual life cycle of humans, if we look at what's happening on the top of the diagram, everything up here is actually haploid because of the process of meiosis. So meiosis is gonna divide the chromosome number in half so that um, the cells can be combined together. But remember the zygote down here is the combination of two haploid cells to make a diploid cell. So we have this alternation in uh, chromosome uh, uh, number or chromosome sets ploidy lab, uh, numbers, we have 2n down here, but then 1n up here. Now, before I talked a little bit about how sexual reproduction uh, increases um, genetic diversity, it's increasing genetic diversity. And I'm just gonna point out the places where it increases genetic diversity, and then we're gonna talk about that in class. The first place we get an introduction of genetic diversity is over here in meiosis, during a process called crossing over. And we'll talk about what that means. It happens during prophase one of meiosis where there's some swapping of chromosome parts. We also, during metaphase one of meiosis, during the first reductional division, we get something called independent assortment. Where we have an independent orientation of maternal and paternal chromosomes. So we get more genetic variation. Both of those um, mechanisms occur over in meiosis. We have a third mechanism that occurs over in fertilization, where we have any sperm, where there are many, 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 many different sperm are going to combine with any egg. And because of that, we call that random fertilization. And because of that, we get a third source of genetic variation in the sexual life cycle. And the, that's in the sexual life cycle of any um, multicellular organism or any sexually producing organism.